Hi guys, Mr. Puller here, back again with Medieval Time Period. This time we're going to look at the Crusades for History of Western Civilization at Fieldcrest High School. Okay, the Crusades came about uh, in the time period in Europe when there's a lot of sort of political problems. And part of those actually involve problems between the popes and the various kings over who is really in charge ultimately, uh, political leaders or the head spiritual leader. Now in England, we've got a situation where it's literally, it's pretty well organized. The king is in charge this is after the Norman invasion uh, and things look pretty good for the most part, but not exactly, you know, like today, the king has powers not quite being limited by the nobles quite yet. In France, not so well organized. Uh, lots of local lords, a king very decentralized, having very, very little powers um, and without you know the nobles coming in to support them. In Germany, we have a thing with the investiture controversy. Uh, who is actually in charge? We've got a Holy Roman Emperor, which is a little bit of a problem with the Holy Roman Empire, where the Pope's appointing somebody to be over all the German princes and that kind of thing, and, and they're sort of resisting that, and that's going to be a, a long-running controversy uh, there. So then Pope Urban II calls for a great crusade. His goals are sort of to heal the Christian split between um, the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church in the West, and the Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox Church in the West, and hope to, hoping to add also the Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire, who are also Christians, although they're Greek Orthodox, you know how that is, um, and helping them out uh, in the defense against the Muslims who have taken over a lot of the Middle East, including the Holy Land, so they're trying to recover that Holy Land itself, you know, including Jerusalem, and they're hoping to actually sort of solidify their leadership uh, of the Church, the Western, the Western Church uh, in Europe, not just over who's in charge of the church, but who's in charge overall as well. So our first crusade, this is called in AD uh, 1096. Um, the first one has a lot of commoners and children very early on who are crushed and that doesn't go so well. However, in terms of military things, it's the first crusade that's actually relatively military successful. Okay, they actually restore lands to the Byzantine Empire. They save the city of Constantinople from the Muslim invaders. They actually retake Jerusalem. Uh, okay, a bit of a massacre in involved in that. seems that they put the city under siege and uh, the Muslims uh, said, if you guys come out, we'll let you go. And so the Muslims came out and they slaughtered like 40,000 of them. I'm no expert, but it doesn't seem like the Christian thing to do. Okay, our first crusade, uh, again, this is in AD 1096. Uh, towards the end of that, we set up four feudal counties in a uh, feudal style. Uh, again, it's a decentralized form of government where there's sort of like a, a, a lord in charge, but then as he gives parts away to other administrators, his power sort of gets diminished as they have power in those areas. Okay, these again, of course, are very weak governments which quickly begin to fail. Our second crusade, yikes, who is this guy? Uh, this is in AD 1144, so we've got a big time jump here, about a, you know 50 plus years or so. Uh, and in this case, we've got, this is led by the King of France and the Holy Roman Emperor, that guy who the Pope appoints to being in charge of the German principalities. Um, and they run into a few problems. There's internal fighting amongst these two guys as to who's in charge and who has more say, and that's gonna be a problem. And they have strong opposition from this guy, the guy of the crazy turban in this picture, uh, that's Saladin. They take back some land, but they don't get back Jerusalem. Uh, and in fact, Saladin beats the Christians, forces, and takes Jerusalem from them. Wait, we went down to get back some land and we lost the crown jewels? That's nice. Okay, our third crusade, this is sometimes referred to as the Crusade of the Three Kings. This is in A.D. 1190. Uh, one of the kings is this guy right there. That's uh, Richard I, sometimes called Richard the Lionhearted, seen as the quintessential uh, king in English history because he's the king in the Robin Hood stories that's off crusading. And the rest of the time a king, he spends most of the, he's king of England, he spends most of his time in France because he's French. And speaks French and he's only in England about 
six months of his reign. But anyway, back to the Crusades here. Uh, one of the guys also involved this was a guy by the name of Barbarossa, Red Beard, who on the way down to the Crusades drowns in an accident. That's okay. If you're going on the Crusade, if you die, you go to heaven. One way ticket. Backstage pass. Now Philip and and Richard, uh, the, Philip is the, from Spain, or excuse me, from, from France. And Philip and Richard hate each other. Again, that's Richard the Lionheart and Philip from France. Um, and part of the reason they hate each other is because they're both really French, and they're going to argue over who's in charge. Just like the Last Crusade, and Philip gets mad and takes his ball. I mean, forces home. Like a little spoiled kid. So anyway, Saladin is a better general, and in fact, he's actually more civilized. Poor Richard here gets sick while he's on crusade, and uh, as a result, he's riding back and forth to Saladin because that's how they did things in war back then. Just get used to it. And uh, he mentions that he's sick, and the doctors are tending to him and letting his blood and the leeches and all that good stuff that helps him get better. And of course, Saladin's horrified, like you probably are right now. He sends his personal physician over there <clears throat> and gets him healed up and ready to go. That doesn't really help though because the Christians are only left with small bits of land by the end of this crusade uh, along the coast. They do however manage to negotiate the fact that this is dumb fighting each other all the time on these crusades and Richard negotiates the fact that they get rights to visit safely as Christians the Holy Land in Jerusalem. The Fourth Crusade, however, because we really want Jerusalem back. This is in A.D. 1202. As I recall it, this is crusading goes sour. Really sour, okay? They gather at Venice to get a ride down there from the Venetian merchants. You know, you get your ships, give us a ride. It's a mission from God, you know, like Blues Brothers. And, uh, of course, the Venetians being nice guys and holy people and believers say, what's in it for us? And so they say... We got these bad guys over in Zara, and they're not Christians, and they're bad pe evil people, and they're hurting us because good Christians. And so they sack Zara for the Venetians. Turns out the real problem was they were trading rivals for the Middle Eastern trade routes. Uh, they also then go on to sack Constantinople. Wait, wasn't that one of the first goals to save Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire along with the Venetians? And so they can expand for the Venetians their trading privileges even further? Okay, the crusade is so far off the mark of uh, saving things and getting back to, you know, the Holy Land for Christianity that the Pope excommunicates all of them, which means no taking part in any sacraments, which means essentially if this was a monopoly, it's uh, go directly to hell, do not pass purgatory, do not collect everlasting life. And the crusaders have to then settle down in Byzantine Greece to find a place to live. Not so good. Here's the routes of some of those crusades, our uh, first crusades, mostly traveling there by land, you know, short uh, water trips. Our second crusade, depending on who you were, but mostly overland here, walking as well. Uh, once we get down to Constantinople, some of us going to the Holy Land and Accra and, and those places by ship. Our third crusade is we've got, you know, uh, Richard the Lionheart, we've got Philip coming down, most of us arriving here by, uh, by boat. Remember, of course, Barbarossa drowns crossing a river, I believe. And then our fourth crusade, that utter and complete terrible disaster is shown as well. Okay, so what's the effects of this? This is all a military disaster and we don't actually get the Holy Land back. Well, there are other attempts that last until about 1270 um, and those things are actually with no success. The last crusader state falls in 1291, but it is important because it is an expression of English power or excuse me, European power outside of Europe for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire. So we got that going for us, okay? And also familiarized them with the Islamic world and the Byzantine world. And of course, that also familiarized them with increased interactions and exchange of knowledge, mostly the knowledge from the ancient Greeks and Romans that had been hidden away and locked up by the church in Europe because you don't need to know about that stuff. And coming back with these guys is that knowledge that is not only the knowledge of the Greeks and Romans, but the Muslims have actually expanded that greatly. Okay, this strengthens the role of the church in the West over the uh, political leaders because a lot of nobles die, and that solidifies in power with the church. And it also enriches Italy and the Italian city states, and they become so rich and are so jealous of the great things they see in the Holy Land, and the fabulous cities. They start wanting the same things back home, which will lead to a rebirth of knowledge and building and art that we'll call the Renaissance, but that's another lesson.
see you with that one.